So when I was in high school, uh, some friends of mine and I, one hot summer day, we decided to go down to the local reservoir for a little bit of fun. And we headed to a rock that is affectionately known as the fridge. Uh, I believe we have a picture of the fridge because it looks like a fridge. On the edge of the, uh, of, of the reservoir, there's this giant rock uh, perpendicular to the water. Uh, and, 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 and you can jump off the top into the water. And it's quite an adrenaline rush for sure. So, um, so we, we decided we would go. It was my first time there. I'd never been there before. And, and, and so we came, we paddled up, we, we got out of our canoes and our kayaks. And, and we climbed up to the top of the rock and we stood up there and we're like, ooh, we really ready? <laughs> we really ready for this? I, I, I don't know if I'm ready. Now, there were some thrill seekers among us who were like, oh, yeah, no big deal, and just ran off, and it was fine. Some of the rest of us, I think I probably took about five minutes of peering over the edge, watching some other people do it, back and forth, back and forth, until I was finally ready to jump the 35 feet or so down into the water. Uh, there was one person in our group who, who, who just took a little longer than the rest of us to mentally prepare, to really be ready. She sat up there for, I think, 20 minutes and, 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 and over to the edge and back and over to the edge as she finally was ready to take the jump one day or one, one moment. And, uh, and, and, and so we find ourselves in the season of getting ready. Are we ready? Are we ready for the coming of Christ? Are we ready for, for, for this season where we remember the incarnation, that God has not stayed far off, but he's come into our lives? Are we ready for the advent just means the visit or the coming? Are we ready for the coming of our Lord? The Bible reminds us that the coming of the Lord can be a, uh, a terrifying thing as well as a really good thing, both at the same time. Are we ready? Uh, this, our story today focuses on somebody who really thought he was ready and in so many ways was. And yet, at the moment of his visitation, he was not ready. He was not ready, but he was willing to be made ready. Zechariah and Elizabeth were both from priestly families. Zechariah was from the, the division of Abijah. Which, so Abijah was one of Aaron's sons. One of the, the, the divisions of priests who had been set aside to minister uh, to the Lord in the, in the tabernacle and now the temple. Uh, as you can imagine, there were, there were th thousands probably of priests around Israel because the family tree had grown. And so these priests lived all around the nation. And, and they would be called up at certain times. Uh, so Zechariah and Elizabeth are called out of their small village, and, and Zechariah is there in Jerusalem now, uh, at the center of it, where it all happens. And, and he is getting ready uh, to serve before the Lord. Now the priests, while they were there, would do a number of things. They would assist in the offering of sacrifices and the preparations of various things. Uh, but twice a day in the temple, they would offer a burning of incense, twice a day. And one priest would, would be allowed to actually go inside of the sanctuary. So the, the temple was divided into the Holy of Holies. Confirmation students, are you listening? We just went over this. The Holy of Holies, where, where the Ark of the Covenant sat, right? Only the high priest could enter there. But outside of that, past the curtain, was the sanctuary, the, the, the holy place. And there in that room was the lampstand and the table with the bread of the presence and also the incense altar, about the size of this pulpit. Twice a day, one priest, chosen by random, chosen by drawing of lots, would be allowed to enter into this holy place and, and burn the incense. Now, this was such an honor to do this. And there were so many priests, not everybody got to do this ever. Some people died before they had their chance. Uh, and, and once you'd been chosen, that was it. It, it was, was a once, literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And, and, and so Zechariah and Elizabeth, we hear they are righteous people. They, they know the law. They live according to the law. They're, they're, they're good people. They have prayed. They've longed. They, they have longed for the restoration of their people. They've longed for a child of their own as well. And, and, and these prayers that, that they have lifted up to God over and over and over again, they've done it in righteousness. No reason for them, their prayers not to be answered, right? And here Zechariah is a righteous priest entering into the temple. This is his moment. He is ready. He has prepared. Zechariah is ready. And yet he's caught off guard, isn't he? If you'd like to open up your Bibles with me, we're in Luke chapter 1. Uh, we're on page 990 in your pew Bibles. Luke chapter 1, uh, we hear when Zechariah comes into the, uh, the holy place, 
uh, he, he sees an angel of the Lord appearing to him, verse 11, and standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was, gri- he was startled, he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. He's gripped with fear. He thought he was ready. He was ready to burn the incense. He was ready to be in the presence of God, but he wasn't ready for an angel. And he certainly was not ready for the word that the angel was about to share with him, right? Your prayer has been heard, the angel says. What prayer? Now, when Zechariah was offering the incense uh, up to God, this, he would have been praying for the nation. He would have been praying for, for the nation to be restored, for the people to be liberated from, from the Roman oversight, from, from the, uh, King Herod, who was, who was not a true Jew. And, and so he was praying for the people. But I wonder also if the angel isn't talking about the prayer uh, that he and, and Elizabeth have prayed for so many years. Probably a prayer that they had long stopped praying a prayer for a child, a son of their own. The angel says, your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And in the next, later in that verse, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. He's to be set aside, to never take fermented drink. He's to be set aside because the Holy Spirit is going to be in him from the beginning. And he will bring the people of Israel back to the Lord their God. Whoa. This was something that Zechariah was certainly not ready for, right? I, I mean, to, to hear that your child would be the one to bring the nation back to God, to turn the hearts of their fathers back to the children, to, to, to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord, that would be incredible. But then go one step further. Zechariah doesn't have a son yet. All of this seems beyond belief. It seems impossible, beyond what is, what, what is realistic, beyond what is logical. The angel comes and he gives him these words. And what he's really doing is he's giving Zechariah an invitation to take a leap of faith. To believe beyond what he has believed. Now certainly Zechariah believes in God. He, he believes in God. He believes in the word of God. He's lived his life in accordance with God and what he believes about God. He has his hope in God. He and his wife love God. But here's an invitation to go even one step further, to believe for for the things that seem impossible, to believe for the things that don't make sense from our perspective, to believe for that which does not seem logical. Was Zechariah ready to take that leap into faith? I'm guessing that most of us here believe in God. We believe in a higher power. I'd even venture to say that most of us probably believe in Jesus Christ, that he was the Son of God, that he died and rose again. But, but are we willing to take our faith a step further than even that? Uh, even, even a step further from being good, righteous, religious people like Zechariah and Elizabeth? Are we willing to believe God for the things that, that are beyond what seems possible or beyond what seems logical? Can we believe that God is in fact coming? We've been waiting 2,000 years, God's people have, for the coming of God. Do we believe that God is actually coming? It doesn't seem logical. It doesn't seem possible. The promises that God has made to his people, do we believe those things? And not just in general, but do we believe them for ourselves? Do we believe that God will in fact provide for us? That God will take care of us? That he will be our security, our safety, when all else fails? Do we believe that God can, in fact, heal ourselves or our loved ones who are sick? Do we believe beyond what seems possible? Do we believe in a way that allows us to take that leap of faith? Now, this doesn't mean that we check our brains at the door. Let's be clear. This doesn't mean that we just believe, oh, because somebody told me it was true. It is true. Our, our, that leap is taken, uh, it, it's grounded in good evidence and good truth. When me and my friends were cliff jumping, which I'm not advocating for, let's be clear here. When me and my friends were cliff jumping, we would have been really foolish if we hadn't checked the water first to make sure there was nothing under the surface, to make sure that the reservoir level was high enough for us to be safe. 
For those of you who have trampolines, if you read the manual, did you read the manual? If you read the manual, it says in there, every time you get on the trampoline, you should check it first for any damage, right? You want to check to make sure the springs aren't rusted through. You want to make sure there's not a hole in the fabric that you're going to twist your ankle in. You look before you jump. You look before you leap. We do the same in faith. We don't just believe the Bible because the Bible says it's true, although it is. But we believe the Bible because because it's trustworthy. We believe the Bible not just because we have some feeling about the Bible, but we believe it because historical evidence and archaeological evidence and manuscript evidence points to the fact that this is in fact truth that God has passed down over thousands of years. And and it reveals truth to us, not just in general, but truth about our God. The Bible is trustworthy. And, and, And the trustworthy Bible tells us that our God can be trusted, that he is trustworthy. We read the story of of God's people, how even when God's people weren't faithful, God was still faithful to them, how he still took care of them in the wilderness, in the desert, in exile, in all these places. We look before we leap, and we can trust that God does, in fact, keep his promises. So when God sends an angel to Zechariah, he knows all this. When God sends an angel to Zechariah, he could trust. He could know that it's safe to take that leap of faith into what seems impossible because God is trustworthy, because God is faithful. He can take the leap. In the book of Genesis chapter 22, uh, Abraham is asked to take a leap that is absolutely uh, unimaginable. Abraham... um, comes to God, or God comes to Abraham, and, and he asks him, uh, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him on the top of Mount Moriah. And Abraham gets up, and he loads up for the journey. It's a three-day journey to the mountain. And they go, and he goes to the top of the mountain and binds up his son, Isaac, to offer him for a sacrifice. Now, those of you who, who know the story know that he doesn't kill him. God stops him, sends an, another angel at the last moment to hold, to hold his hand while the knife is raised in, 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 the, in the air. But the question that God was asking Abraham was, do you trust me? And how far do you trust me? Do you trust me even for what seems impossible, even for what seems illogical? Because God had made a promise about Isaac. Isaac was the child of promise. Sarah and Abraham had had, had waited so long for a child. Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100 years old. There's some of us here who are those ages. Can you imagine having a child at that age, right? They believed beyond what was possible. And here's this child, the one who God has said, I'm going to bring the fulfillment of all these covenant promises through this child. And then God says, now I want you to take this child and sacrifice him to me. It's a paradox, right? How can God keep this promise while at the same time asking for this? It doesn't make sense. It seems impossible. And and so Abraham is invited here to take a leap of faith beyond just believing in God or even in his promises, but acting in a way that shows that he trusts him to bring about even what is not possible. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, he, he, he talks about this. He says, uh, Abraham's faith brought him up to a certain point, but there was a moment where uh, he couldn't, it was not just another step to take the next step in faith, but it had to be a jump. It, this was a, an entirely different kind of faith. This was trusting on a new level. This was beyond even the ethical realm of, of what seems right and what we know that God does not want us to kill. And, 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 and yet he asks, he takes his leap of faith into what seems impossible. And of course, God catches him and provides exactly what he needs. So Kierkegaard uh, muses at the beginning of his book on this, he, and, and he, he talks about, I wonder what Abraham's countenance was like when he went those three days up to the mountain. Was he walking kind of somberly and soberly, like willing to do this because God asked him to, but, but angry about it and, 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 and about to lose his, his faith? Or was he walking in faith? Somehow in, in trust that, that what he says to his son, when Isaac asked, but uh, dad, we have the fire, we have the wood, uh, but, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, well, God, God will provide the sacrifice. 
Abraham believes that at the core of his being. And so as he goes on this long journey, he is living in faith. He's taken that leap and, 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 and is in that place where his life and his son's life and the life of the whole nation of Israel, let's be honest, is in God's hands. Completely in God's hands. How did he, how did he do this? How was he able to take that leap? He was able to do it because he knew who God was. Because he knew that God was trustworthy. Because God had in fact provided a child to a 90-year-old and a 100-year-old man and woman. Because he knew that, that God had kept his promises before time and time again. And he could trust him. That's why Paul calls Abraham the father of all who have faith. He's the father of the faithful, the father of those who have faith. Because this is the kind of faith, the kind of leap of faith that God calls us to have, to take. Do we take this leap of faith? Are we ready to take this leap of faith? If I can say for myself, I just want to say that most days, probably not. Most days, probably not. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I hope in the coming of Christ. And yet to believe God for what seems impossible, for what seems illogical, am I ready to take that leap every day? Am, am I ready to trust God that, that if, if I really place my finances in his hand, if I really give beyond what seems logical or reasonable, that God's going to somehow provide for me and my family? Am I ready to take that leap? Am I ready to pray prayers of healing and provision that are bold beyond what seems logical or possible? Am I ready? Now, some days I say to myself, well, if an angel came down to me and stood before me and said, said this is what God's going to do, surely I would believe but if you look at this story, you got to admit that that's not the case. Zechariah had it all together. He and Elizabeth had it all together. They were righteous. They believed. And yet, in the moment of visitation, Zechariah was not ready to take the leap of faith. Even the presence of an angel wasn't enough to change regular faith, regular belief into this belief in the beyond, this leap of faith into what seems impossible the kind of faith that Abraham shows us. So if I was there, if an angel showed up to me in my office tomorrow and made some ridiculous promise, I would probably respond exactly the way that Zechariah did. I would probably ask that question that is filled with doubt. Let's, let, let's look at that. Uh, he, he, he says, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Very carefully stated, well played, Zechariah. How can I be sure of this? How can I be sure of this? Uh, it's some, uh, the, a literal translation there says, on what basis can I know this? It's a question of doubt. It's a question of skepticism. And, and, and Gabriel's answer is, really? <laughs> I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to you to give you this message. A message of hope, a message of answering your prayers this is what you've been praying for. Didn't you think that this could possibly happen? I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to you to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. If I was there, I would have done the same thing that Zechariah did. I would have asked the question. I would have been shut in silence. I would have come out of the temple in silence like Zechariah did. Zechariah's silence. I was curious about this, and when I've read this story, I've oftentimes seen it as a punishment, right? Zechariah wasn't able to, to have the kind of faith that God wanted him to have, and so he's punished with silence. And yes, that's an aspect of what's happening here. Silence is, in, in, in a way, a punishment. But, but in another way, it's actually also the sign that Zechariah asked for, isn't it? This is how he's going to know that these things are true. You're not going to be able to speak, the angel says. And then later we find out he can't hear either because people have to use signs to talk to him. He is in total and complete silence for nine or ten months until the child is born. This is his sign. 
This is how he knows that what God has said he's going to do, he will, in fact, do. But I, I, I look at this story, and, I, and, and, and I, I think that there's one more aspect of this, too. I think that this silence was actually Zechariah's preparation. This was the way that Zechariah got ready. He was standing at the edge of the cliff. This is, he couldn't jump on his own. But God said, it's okay, be, because I'm going to help you get ready. And I'm going to give you this space of silence where my Holy Spirit will be present to you, where I will speak to you, where I'll minister to you, where, where I will make you ready to take that leap of faith, the leap of faith in, 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 into a kind of life lived with God that you cannot even imagine. The, the angel says that this is going to happen whether or not Zechariah believes it, right? These things which will come true, which will happen in, in, in their time. So, so it's not like Ze God needs Zechariah to believe him. But God wants Zechariah to not be left behind. He wants him to be a part of the story. He wants him to be a part of the coming of, of, uh, of Christ and the coming of this new kingdom of God. If you fast forward later in the story, the very next words that, that, that Zechariah speaks, it's after John is born. His, his relatives are calling him Zechariah. And Elizabeth says, no, 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 his name is John. That's what we're going to name him. And the people say, but nobody in your family is by the name of John. And, and so they ask him, they motion to Zechariah and say, what's his name? And he writes on a tablet, he says, his name is John which at first blush may not seem to be very significant, except that those are words of faith. Because he's saying this child that was born is the same child that that angel was talking about. His name is John. This child is the same child through whom God's going to prepare his people for the coming of the, his kingdom. His name is John. And then the very next words that he speaks are a beautiful song. He, he, he starts praising and blessing God. And, and he, he prophesies. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. This is in, um, in this end of chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 76. First he starts and he, he prophesies about the coming of Jesus, which is even more evidence that, that the Holy Spirit has done its work in him because he doesn't speak about his own child first, but he speaks about this redemption that's coming for the whole nation. But then he speaks to his child. He says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. These are words of faith. These are words of insight into the redemption of God. Insight that Zechariah never would have had if he hadn't been able to take that leap into the unknown. The leap of faith. And in addition to giving God all the glory and, and, and the praise, it shows us that he's not so consumed with his own family and his life. He speaks about the whole nation. He speaks about, uh, about the goodness that God is bringing. He shows us that yes, he has taken the jump. He was ready. He took the leap. God didn't leave him behind. I don't know where you are in your faith journey. Some of us might have a hard time believing what the word of God says in the first place. Some of us might believe parts of it, but not the whole thing. Some of us might believe up here, but it really hasn't gotten down into the way that we live our lives, into our hearts, and changed the way we live. Some of us, like Zechariah, are good religious people who believe all the right things, who are righteous as far as, as we can manage on, a, on our own and with the help of Christ. We still aren't ready to take that leap, to believe what seems beyond possible, but to believe the paradoxes of faith, to believe that even light can shine in the shadow of death. A light will shine. Christ will come. His reign will be good. His reign will be unending and eternal. Now, wherever we are in our journey today, our invitation is the same. To examine the trampoline, if you will. To look in the water, to peer over the edge, to see for ourselves that God is good and that he is trustworthy. And, 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 and we can trust that if we take that leap, he will catch us. We can trust him for what seems impossible. 
And to help us to get ready for this, the, to take that leap, he gives us this season of Advent, this season of preparation, like the preparation that Zechariah went through, a season for silence and stillness and, and expectant waiting. And you know, I, I think it's the work of the evil one that this season is so busy because it's the exact opposite of what God actually needs it to be for us to really be ready. Zechariah's story tells me that silence is exactly what we're going to need if we're going to be ready for this kind of faith, Abraham's kind of faith. Silence in the presence of God where the Holy Spirit shapes us, gives us a new kind of faith, makes us ready for the coming of the Lord, ready for the coming of Christ. So this season of Advent, let's not just prepare for the celebration. Let's not just listen to the story of the Christ child who was born in Bethlehem and say, oh yes, isn't that nice? And oh yes, don't I believe that happened? But, but in the stillness and the quietness, let's let that story seep down deep into our lives and shape us so that we too can step into those places. Take that leap of faith beyond what's reasonable, beyond what's possible. The Holy Spirit alone is the one who can make us ready, who alone can plant true faith in our hearts. And so we pray, may it be so. May it be so. In my life, in your life as well. Amen.